Great. Good evening, everyone, and, and Happy New Year. Um, I would like to welcome you all to this licensing uh, committee meeting. Um, this is an in-person meeting. Any councillors who are accessing this meeting remotely are reminded that you are not counted as being present for the purposes of the Local Government Act 1972, and you may not vote on any item under consideration. You may, however, contribute to the discussion and participate in a non-decision-making capacity. This meeting will be live streamed for public viewing and a record of the decisions taken will be published after the meeting. For those who may be aware, Councillor Patrick has replaced Councillor Rathbone in this committee. Um, and it's really nice to see Councillor Patrick back, so very welcome to her. Um, I understand a member of the public has joined the meeting remotely or will be joining the meeting remotely uh, to ask a question. Um, and I would like to welcome them to the meeting when they arrive, and I'll do that when they do arrive. Um, so agenda item one, um, apologies for absence. Um, apologies for absence have been received from councillors Kennedy, um, Patrick, Walker and Root and Councillor Sizer is online. Welcome, Councillor Sizer, thank you. Sure. Um, Sorry, I have a uh, send apologies from Councillor Conway. Oh, thank you very much, and Councillor Conway. Um, uh, item, uh, agenda item two, declarations of interest. Uh, do members have any interest to declare? The same as last time, really, that I, Councillor Fox from West, and a small part is on there. I also live in Shacklewell, just on the edge of Dorston, so. Okay, great, thank you very much. Any, any other? Dalston, Ward Councillor, and Sheffield Okay, thank you very much. Um, agenda item three, minutes of the previous meeting, uh, pages seven to 12. Um, can we agree uh, the minutes of the previous meeting of the licensing committee held on the 14th of November, 23? Great. Why did that something? Sorry, it's been difficult already. Um, it, in it, it sort of says that it was noted that it would be good to talk to councillors when they do the consultation. Could it just be noted that they didn't consult with any of the ward councillors? I think that is actually quite okay. an important point um, that we weren't involved, because I think that did have an impact on how much they were able to link into groups that we could have signposted them to. OK, well, I'll note that. OK, thank you for that one. Apologies, um, sorry. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't see you that's there. That's all right, not at all. Um, councillor for Shoreditch, Hoxton Eastern Shoreditch, so I need to declare that. Okay, thank you, Councillor Sizer. Um, okay, uh, agenda item four, questions to the committee. Um, we have a question that has been submitted from a member of the public in relation to the cumulative impact options at agenda item seven. Um, and I would like to suggest that we take this question at that relevant agenda item. Is that okay, everyone? Yeah, thank you. Um, agenda item five, uh, the late night levy. New six, quarter three and four update, pages 13, 16 in your report. Um, and I would like to invite Samantha uh, Mathis, late night levy manager, to introduce the report, please. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll be very brief this evening and just summarise the main points of the report as follows. Um, training levels remain good, and since the beginning of the programme, we are now uh, we have now trained over 2,600 individuals in total with monthly free sessions confirmed until 2025. Um, the Don't Cross the Line campaign was a, was a big focus of the last six months um, and the welfare activities that went alongside that. Uh, and we've had some really good engagement numbers online and lots of really good content from our venues who participated in the campaign. And we will be presenting a full uh, summary of the evaluation of that campaign at the next committee meeting as part of our update. I think for me, one of the most notable milestones is that we have reached 100% of all the bars, pubs and clubs on the online portal, which means uh, they all have an account. Uh, we have uh, manager contacts for each one and they all receive our weekly briefing, which at the current time has an opening rate of between 50 and 70%, which is quite high. Yeah, right. um, the accreditation scheme is steadily growing with now almost 30 venues and more applications in process. And we will be doing a push coming up in the next months to promote it even further. And lastly, we have successfully launched our new noise and planning checker for venues, which has gone live this month. Uh, and that was with, based on the GLA funding that we had received. So we will continue to be looking at that and fine tuning the service based on ongoing feedback from operators. Those are the main points, but I'm happy to take any questions on the full report. Yeah, members, have any questions? 
Sorry, I'm not going to ask anything. <laughs> um, Councillor Maxwell. No, um, I mean, first of all, I just want to thank um, Councillor Diana Thomas and the officers for the hard work on this. It really is impressive what we've been doing. I've just a basic question, really, of information the Hackney Nights Accreditation Scheme. What's that in terms of percentages that have signed up? Because I don't, and have we got like a target of how many we would like? Yeah, I think the original target was set at 50 because obviously this is a, is a, it's meant to be kind of like a, uh, a, an accreditation that has a bit of prestige associated with it. They have to go through, they have to meet quite a, a long list of criteria and have really robust safety policies. So I think the initial objective was 50. So we're, we're about at 30 now. So yeah. yeah, we still have some way to go. And obviously, you know, there's no limit, yeah. but. Uh, What's the sort of percentage then of venues? Because I can't, I don't know how many venues we have. What, what's that the percentage of? Uh, I don't have the percentage. Yeah, I mean, don't worry, I'm yeah. just curious. I, I can but, take that yeah. away. And, but and thanks, no, it's very, thanks for the report, it's very good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Doug. Um, Oh, thank you. I just would like to echo um, Councillor Maxwell's uh, comments um, and thank you so much to Councillor Vagana Thomas and to yourself, Samantha. And also, I'm really pleased to see that there are four new added courses mm -hmm. and the Gender Diversity Online course and the LGBTQIA uh, welfare training. And also, really pleased to see the Don't Cross the Line campaign being successful. So, I would like to specifically congratulate you on that. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Likewise. Uh, Councillor Garwit just chipped in first. Thanks. Um, yeah, adding my huge thanks to all the hard work that's gone in. And um, just a couple of questions, just to understand a bit more of the detail. I think the noise and planning checker project sounds really interesting. Just if you could just tell us a bit about what that's the aim of that is or if anything there's anything we can do as councillors to kind of support that and then just my understanding i think you don't cross the line stuff straight i just wondered how that phrase was developed like who's involved in yeah sure so in terms of the noise and planning uh, the noise and planning checker um so th the way it works is that venues will now get notifications when a noise report is made against their venue so uh, we're using the language using the word report not complaint because it does include in unsubstantiated reports but um, essentially it just it, it just increases the transparency and increases the time so they can actually deal with things in real time as opposed to being notified weeks later, which, you know, by the time a complaint gets to three weeks, four weeks down the line, it can be uh, quite exacerbated. Yes, so it's a direct response to yeah. what I heard at Publish. So that's really great that you've responded yeah, so it, actively to that. Yeah, so following a weekend, they'll be advised of the noise report before the following weekend, essentially. Amazing. Yeah, and in terms of the Don't Cross the Line campaign, so we had multiple stakeholders on that working group. It's something where we also consulted with young uh, people and we conducted quite a lot of surveys to come to that line. And that was all based on that perpetrator focused approach that we had decided on. Right. Thank you. Councillor Vitale Thomas. Well, thanks, Chair. Just a quick one to say thank you to Sam and Jerry for the leadership as well as David in terms of our don't cross the line campaign. It's really, it, it is something that I'm very proud of, in particular, the way we have involved young people in Hackney, if you people that attended the uh, 16 days of activism can see that the stencil that have young Hackney put on a street about don't cross the line. So it was really good. And when we had that launch, uh, the police are actually using Hackney as a sort of uh, model because um, uh, the assistant commissioner that leads on violence against women and girls with the Met actually attended one of the welfare to see what the campaign is about. If there is something they met, how they can contribute to it, not just at Acme, but if other boroughs can pick such a campaign up. So it is good and all thanks to your work, Sam. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah, I would like to extend my thanks as well. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. To the team and to the members. Uh, Council Remote well. World. Um, yeah, I just wondered if you could talk us a little bit through um, the points that you made about um, the work that you did around misogyny and sexual harassment and how maybe some examples of how 
the work is dealing with violence against women and girls in the nighttime economy, because that's a particular concern. Yeah, so I think this whole campaign is kind of involved in that piece of work. So what we want to establish is zero tolerance spaces in our nighttime economy. So places where any form of harassment, uh, hate or abuse is not tolerated. So that was the main kind of uh, line of the campaign, but also that went along with a lot of work with the venues to cultivate those those kind of zero tolerance spaces. And that starts with the culture and the ethos and also the response that staff have to certain incidents. So, um, so yeah, in a nutshell, that's essentially the work that we're doing with the venues. Okay, and how are we measuring the success of that? So bringing rates down. Yeah, so we're looking at a variety of things, obviously figures, uh, crime figures and uh, incident reports, as well as CCTV reports. Um, we're also looking at, uh, you know, the evaluation metrics of the campaign itself. So how many, you know, how many engagements we got, how much, how many hits on our website we got, how many, and that's currently being prepared as part of the 16 days evaluation as well. So we can, like I said uh, earlier, we can provide the full kind of metrics from the campaign um, at the next committee meeting. Yeah. Just want to maybe uh, talk to us when we're through the, the welfare uh, tent that we set up, just how that works a little bit, just so yeah, sure. maybe she knows already. But Yeah, so we essentially uh, created a space in the NT footprints, so had very visible sort of tents put up with a pol with police presence, enforcement presence, as well as officers from our team. So myself and my support officer. Yes. Um, and essentially what we were doing is promoting the campaign, promoting the messaging behind the campaign, but also providing a place where people could come to ask for assistance if they needed it. So we did deal with, you know, for instance, people who were very intoxicated, who had lost their friends, or maybe they were a bit sick from their night out. So just tending to those individuals and ensuring that uh, they had a place to go to access help and support. Yeah, and there's a QR code, I think, that, that, that is given out. Yeah. And when you click on that, you can basically provide feedback on your night out, okay. essentially, as to how you got on. And there's kind of consultation, and, you know, we actually go out and talk to people on the street about their evening and how to stay safe. So it's really, it's really good. And they provide resources as well, like water and, uh, slippers yeah. and uh, slippers, believe it or not, because sometimes you know the high heels don't work anymore. <laughs> um, we also distribute some condoms for the public health team as well. Yeah, so it's kind of a, it's very good. I mean, I highly recommend going down to see it actually next time we do it. Oh yeah, Councillor Sizer. Um, yeah, just to echo everything else that has been said. Such good work, and especially to see the youth involvement. Um, I've read through the report. I was just wondering if there's any more updates around um, incidents and addressing the issue of spiking. Um, thank you. I know it's been a big focus of yours um, as a team, uh, but it'd just be great to hear any updates around that. Yeah, I mean, spiking remains a, obviously an area of concern. Concern, I mean, we, we, we put it at the forefront of our trainings on how to respond to them. But I must say we've had quite a few positive responses to these incidents where you know, the, the, the actual victim has been, uh, the interference from the venue has stopped the victim from being spiked and things like that. So it is quite positive, but obviously I think it's an ongoing area of work and we will continue to have that as a focus of our of our training and our work with our venues. Just a quick question, similar vein really, just in any kind of update. So I mean, you sent wrong the festive, the Kind of um incidents from the festive period and i just wanted if you could talk a bit about that and why you think i know you said that they were kind of less than previous years and just mm -hmm. what maybe contributed to that well i i think first off uh we haven't had any nte NT related sexual offenses over the festive period this year which is the first year that that's happened so um quite quite yeah quite positive um and i i do think overall we have managed we, we've seen a, a reduction in in crime, but I mean, I can't give you exact stats tonight, but I'm happy to provide a, a report on that next committee. Thanks. Okay. Any further questions on this one? Yep. Yes, yeah, it's amazing work, really. I mean, it's terrific. Yeah. Um, I'd say, and and you know, just let's just keep keep going on this because it's just really good. Um, an agenda item five. Uh, no, so we've done that one. Oh yeah. So can we agree to note the report and the appendix? Okay, no, Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Uh, okay, so agenda item six now is the licensing service annual report 22-23. And can I ask uh, David Stewart, the business regulation team leader, licensing and technical support, to introduce the report. Thank you, David. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the report uh, is uh, agenda item six, as the Chair says. So um, hopefully uh, members would have read most of its contents. And so what I'll do is just highlight a few of the items that are in there. Um, so we've reported on, um, on our figures annually, just to give uh, members a bit of an update on the work that the service area carries out and some of the common trends and statistics that we see. Um, so premises licenses are what tends to uh, be the focus for licensing subcommittees, obviously. Those are the types of application that tend to come to licensing committee more than anything else, and those in variation. So we've seen a continued fall in the number of the new licenses that we've grown over the past five years. Not entirely sure why that is, but that, um, that trend has continued in the last in the last year. Um, and then anything related to um, process licenses appears to remain quite consistent. So the numbers of DPS variations and transfers, licenses changing hands, etc. And they they remain quite consistent, or the numbers of those remain quite consistent each year, and and um, even uh, did so during the pandemic as well, during the years of the all the time that we were interrupted by the pandemic. Um, on the subject of the pandemic, temporary event notices uh, are back up, or the numbers of those have continued to climb, and we're not at a level that we used to be at before the pandemic uh, restrictions. Um, but, but as you can see there from uh, on page 24, the, the numbers have grown over the past year. Um, but really quite, quite some uh, margin over the previous year. Um, I've included this graph here, uh, which, which plots the um, number of temporary event notices received across London. Um, and you can see that Hackney received the second highest number uh, after Westminster. But it should be noted that Camden, which also had quite a significant nighttime economy, didn't return their statistics. So um, it's, it's worth noting that. Um, reviews uh, peaked in the year prior to this year that we're looking at now. And a lot of those applications were, were due to pandemic type activities or concern raised by um, a responsible authority as a result and uh, also um, one particular premises had new had uh, a number of licenses uh, issued in respect of it and that those licenses were reviewed on more than one occasion so that that skewed the figure somewhat but, but the number of reviews overall has has fallen on on the previous year and as a quickly subcommittee hearings um no doubt members of that these have remained quite consistent over the past year uh, and massage and special treatment licenses uh, they've returned or they appear to be returned to pre-back pre-pandemic levels um and that's it really in terms of just to speak gambling act applications are fairly consistent and re uh, renewals of uh, gambling licenses and uh, just looking ahead to what we'll be working on, Samantha has already touched on some of the plans for Acne Nights as we continue to do that work. Um, we're, we're introducing more inspections of licensed premises and uh, we're continuing to implement our new software, sales, Salesforce um, software. So that, those are our key um, activity uh, projects that we've got planned for the next four months or that we're currently working on. Okay, thank you very much. David, um, do members have any questions or comments to make about these stats? Uh, uh, Councillor Maxwell. <laughs> um, no, thank you for the report. It's really, really helpful and really informative. Mm. Um, I was just wondering if you've got any thoughts about how the pandemic has impacted. Well, we know how it's impacted, but have you had any sort of feedback from licensees about how they see it going? Do they see people coming back as it was before, or has there perhaps been a culture shift? I was just quite curious if we get a feel for if nighttime economy would be different now, even once people feel more confident that there's a bit of slightly different culture about going out. 
Um, I mean, I've heard various things anecdotally about um, a shift in uh, how people socialise in some cases. Mm -hmm. um, I saw some that you can add to this as well. <laughs> sure. um, uh, like I've, I've spoken to a particular opera, um, a number of operators who have said um, the city works. Some of those who work in the city might not so much be around on Fridays like they were, but it's it's, it's shifted to Thursdays in cases. Yeah, the work, like the work exactly working from home has made a difference in some areas, mainly in the areas closest, the areas of the borough closest to the city, mm -hmm. uh, but then other areas not so much mm -hmm. um so it, it really depends i guess on which operator you speak to mm -hmm. um but the numbers of premises are, are still fairly consistent the applications are but um i think just various economic um, challenges mm -hmm. well. the cost of living yeah. Yeah. Like, haven't had a number of years of not socialized yeah, yeah. thanks uh, councillor garbett thanks um yeah, thanks. This is really interesting. Um, I just had a couple of like why questions, if you like enlighten us to what you think. I know there's loads of multiple factors that influence these things. But in terms of kind of page four, where there's like less, is it my understanding that that's less, that we're granting less licenses? It's not that less are being, is it that less are being applied for or less are being granted? Okay, yeah, it's it would be less. Um, with new yeah, less, uh, less new licenses, yeah. uh, so less applications in that respect. Right, so it's not that we're granting, yeah, because you were saying that kind of subcommittees are consistent, so it's not that we're granting less, it's just that there's less overall. Yeah. And why do you think we've got more, well, yeah, why do you think we've got more tens is another one, like why, is there any, is what? it just the nature of the fact we've got more or, or, or tens in the previous years or just generally that we're quite high for tens is it just that oh, uh, high. does it speak to the fact that we maybe haven't given the license appropriate licenses to venues so they need to use tens more or is it just the nature of the fact we've got a large nighttime economy uh, i think it's the, the nature of the nighttime economy and um, more so that's why i guess it would have been interesting if we could have seen what camden's figures were mm -hmm. um, Mm. in Camden and Westminster maybe with the most or you know sort of most populous um, nighttime economies and then Southwark not that far behind and those three are at the top uh, without Camden there so um, I think it's that it's, it's for some years now we've we've um, had quite high numbers of of temporary event licenses and um, as you can imagine uh, we went into lockdown in March. Um, the first quarter of, or it would have been the second quarter of that year, and so that that was a massive. That was a reason for such a number. Thanks. Thank you, David. Um, Councillor Susan Ruler. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, David, for this report. I've just got a, a specific question on the summary table on page thirty-one. Um, sort of down towards the bottom, we said there where, where it says premises licensed revoked, um, and in 21, 22, there were nine, as opposed to the other years where there were one and two, so there's a bit of a spike. Uh, is there a particular reason for that? 21 and 22 is actually um, a little bit skewed because there was one premises that had three licenses um, and three um, review applications under Section 51, so that's your standard review application, if you like, and then subsequently three applications for summary reviews um, by the police so that one premises had six review applications that, and the um, decision was to revoke all three licenses so, so that, that's that's, that's right. skewed so if you were to take that as one premises it would re right. reduce it from 19 to 15. thank you mm -hmm. Councillor Pichella Thomas. Well, I see just to say thanks to David for the for the report. Um, again, I know uh, some of us on the licensing committee have heard that uh, from so, uh, some of our licensee that tents are not given in Hackney, Hackney we're not approving terms. I think it is good to have the data with us and being able to tell that actually 
after mm -hmm. giving a license, premises tends to operate uh, in contrary to some of the uh, people out there mm -hmm. are seeing. So say, thank you for the start and making it the report very transparent for people to understand and see where we are. And to, I think, to colleagues on licensing committee, this is a committee that is quite challenging. Many of you will need to sit in the committee that twice a month or sometimes on a monthly basis. So just to say thank you for your work. All the those applications that are granted, I think half of them are application that would come or would have come to the licensing committee that people here have sat to hear and make decisions on. So thanks to the chair and other members of the committee. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much and extend my thanks to, to members because it is challenging. We've got lots to do as councillors um, and we do spend quite a bit of time on, on licensing so it's much appreciated um, for your professionalism and expertise. Um, okay, uh, any more? Questions out there, Councillor Sizer? Okay. Yep. Yeah, okay. Really interesting report. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. Okay, great. So, uh, can we agree to note the report on the appendix? Great. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, this is agenda item six uh, cumulative impact options, pages 35 to 44 in the report. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have a question that relates to this agenda item that has been submitted by Kerry Maisie, who's online. Welcome, Kerry. Uh, Happy New Year to you. Um, both of whom uh, are co-chairs of Dalston Pub Watch and members of the Late Night Levy Board. Um, so, Kerry, would you like to ask your question, please? She says she's having some internet issues, so if you could just um, oh, really? read it and respond. Oh, apparently she's having some internet issues, so mm -hmm. I, I shall just, just read it. Can you hear yeah, us? I'm, I'm sorry, my my connection's not super reliable, so I have asked Natalie to read it if that's okay. Yeah, I can read it for you if you want. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so this is the question: um, a Home Office Impact Assessment, November 2016, on giving CIAs a statutory basis said it will place a greater onus on licensing authorities (LAs) to ensure that the evidence they use as the basis of their CIAs is robust. In particular, we would like to increase the transparency of the process that local authorities go through when deciding to retain existing uh, CIPs and ensure that when a decision is taken by a local authority to implement or retain a CIA, it is based on up-to-date evidence and is appropriate and proportionate for the promotion of the licensing objectives. Um, that is the question. No, so the question is just here. So in view of that, this is question. Oh, sorry, yeah. So in view of this, the question is, um, given the extensive and robust evidence presented in the commissioned report, which suggests that the cumulative impact area in Dalston is no longer proportionate, we would like to ask the committee what type of evidence and reporting councillors require in the future if they were to accept that Dalston no longer has activity that would warrant a cumulative impact area. Would members like me to read that out again? Yes, please. So given the extensive and robust evidence presented in the Commission's report, which suggests that the cumulative impact area in Dalston is no longer proportionate, we would like to ask the committee what type of evidence and reporting would councillors require in the future if they were to accept that Dalston no longer has activity that would warrant a cumulative impact area? My response, Kerry, to this is, you will be aware that at its meeting on the 14th of November 23, some members of the licensing committee expressed a view that a special policy area um, should apply to some, if not all of the previously defined Dalston SPA. However, it should be noted that no decision has been made, this is very important, no decision has yet been made um, in relation to a consultation on publishing a cumulative impact assessment which would set out a policy approach in Dalston. The licensing committee is considering an options paper at this evening's meeting. Um, 
Paragraph 14.29 of the guidance issued by the Home Office sets out the information that local authorities can draw on when considering cumulative impact. And this includes local crime and disorder statistics, including statistics on specific types of crime and crime hotspots, statistics on local antisocial behaviour offences, health-related statistics such as alcohol-related emergency attendances and hospital admissions, environmental health complaints, particularly in relation to litter and noise, complaints recorded by the local authority, which may include complaints raised by local residents or residents associations, um, residents questionnaires, evidence from local and parish councillors, and evidence obtained through local consultation. Should members be minded to agree to consult, which is what we're trying to do tonight, our decision tonight is whether we go out to consultation, that's the decision we are trying to make this evening. Um, the committee will take into consideration any views, comments, and further evidence received during any consultation and making a final decision. Um, did you get all that, Kerry? Did you hear all that? I did, yes, thank you. Um, um, do you have a supplementary question? I don't, know. Thank you. Thank you very much for attending. Send that to her in writing. Ask it. We can send that to you in writing, Kerry. Yeah. That that's... would be great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and thank you for attending this evening. So can I come yeah. in? Oh, Kerry, thanks very much. I know this afternoon at the late night levy board, uh, your co-chair raised the point that in the last pub watch, there were... Uh, many of your members that were concerned about this. I think it is important. It, again, I'm not too sure who attended that meeting. Uh, I'm not too sure if we have a council representative there to explain to people what stage of this we are, that no decision has been taken around this, that this is where we are. So it is important because I know uh, you've raised this question as scary, but this is part, you were representing the whole of the Dustin area pub watch. And I'm wondering how you think uh, this message can go back to them, or do you think it's okay with that written uh, response to you that you'll be able to pass it to people to understand where the old uh, CIA is at the moment. Um, I'm, I'd be happy to pass it to the members. I think that their concerns were more around the fact that we have been asking for evidence for a long time now and having been presented with some very robust evidence, it did seem in the November 14th meeting that many of the councillors disregarded the evidence base in favour of anecdotal evidence um, and, a, and, and a status quo approach. But yes, I'd be happy to, I'll be happy to present anything you send to the group. Thanks, thanks, Kerry. Not too sure what you meant by evidence, but that is fine. Thanks very much. Oh, I, I was referring to the commissioned report uh, that was presented in the uh, November 14th process. meeting. Sorry? I said there is a process to reviewing, uh, to making a cumulative impact assessment. Maybe David, yeah. you can come in. It is happening every four years, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> it is, it is. And it, and it is our hope that cannot, tonight. It is for impossible for the council to just be reviewing, yeah. making a review of CIA every year. So no, that, but but when the council has commissioned an extensive report with public money, we would expect that the evidence is looked at um, with due weight, and th that would be now. And of course, it is our hope that tonight um, you decide not to go to consultation on a special policy area for Dalston, and you decide to remove it in line with what the report would suggest. Um, but in the case that that doesn't happen, it would be good to know what type of evidence you would require in the future to recognise that Dalston may not have the impact that maybe it once did. 
Okay, thank you, Carrie, for that. Um, thank you. Uh, David, would you like to come in? Yeah, do you, do you just um, just to maybe help Barry yeah, yeah. to, to, to Kerry, because I, because Kerry, I know that um, th this process now has changed as a legislative change uh, a few years ago. So the the process for introducing a cumulative impact policy is 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 changed from um, say the last time, well not the last time, the time before the last time that we looked at the policy, we would draft the policy and that would. And then we would publish the evidence um, that we relied upon to um, to uh, define, in the case of Hackney, Shoreditch, and Dalston as special policy areas. Uh, that would would consult on that published uh, um, draft policy with the evidence, and then um, go out for consultation, um, come back to licensing committee. They would consider the consultation reports. Um, and then we go to a full council and uh, uh, licensing committee make a full council to recommend um, make a recommendation to full council and the council would adopt that policy so that that was a process where now is um, two two if you like two processes where the policy the development of the publication of the um, licensing policy is a separate piece of work if you like um, policy is in place um, and that policy we have at the moment doesn't uh, define any special policy areas. So there isn't, there aren't any special policy areas in Hackney at the moment because of the last version of the policy where they where they were defined um, expired in August um, of last year. So what we're doing now is just discussing whether um, we would consult on. Um, publishing a community impact assessment and so the consultation is is purely for uh, the, the licensing committee to or the authority to set out its reasons why it's considering um, publishing a community impact assessment give a general indication of the areas whether it be part or more than one part um, which is considering to be described in the assessment um, and then whether that assessment would apply to all types of authorizations, so all types of license, all types of club premises certificate, or or some identified um, types of license or club premises certificate. So that's that's the stage we're at now. So um, we're not going out to consult on a policy or to remove a policy, or um, we're just going. We would be if the members decide today to go out to consultation. It's having regard to the research which has been commissioned. And then make a decision about um, about that base essentially. Thanks, David. Yeah, um, I think uh, I mean it, it is the evidence that's being commissioned that's kind of our concern here, and the fact that you're mentioning it is great. Um, and I think that we do have to realise that we're at an important fork in the road tonight, and not minimise that. So I think tonight the We'll, if I'm not mistaken, there'll be a vote as to whether you go to consultation on a cumulative impact area being applied in Dalston or not. Um, so, of course, it's our hope that you have due regard to the evidence and decide that there should not be a consultation at all on a cumulative impact area in Dalston. But my so, question was really around the fact that there are two questions which would apply a cumulative impact area and also the boundary has not been changed which would was really strongly indicated in the um, report that there was not an issue with cumulative impact in the north or south boundaries of Dalston. So there are indications that maybe the report hasn't been taken with the weight that we thought it should be given. Um, but if indeed it has been, then that would be fantastic. Yeah, okay, Carrie, thanks for that. But just to reassure you, um, and we do, I mean, I will beg to differ on what the report contains, yeah. because in the report, um, it says, you know, there's, there's a, an increase in intensity around the heart of Dalston. And as you mentioned um, about the north and south parts, stretches of the former, the former SPA remaining consistently low. That, that, so therefore we can look at that 
uh, topping and tailing, for example, of the area if it comes to that. Um, but certainly I would say that there are still issues in Dalston, certainly in the heart of Dalston, um, which the committee will need to consider in terms of you know, ongoing policy going forward if we feel that that's what it, it needs. So that's where I stand on this, Kerry, just to be perfectly open and transparent with you. Yeah. And I of think- Of course, if I, if I could just mention though, that also, I mean, Dolstrand- oh, uh, yeah. uh, Can't uh, 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 yeah. yeah, okay. no. uh, yeah. yeah. just advise um, from the government's perspective, um, in the correspondence that we, I shared with you by email, I did say that you were allowed one supplementary question and um, any further, there was no other further comments that can be made. So there, you, you are essentially not able to make any um, statements or express any opinion. So I think your question has been sufficiently answered at this time. I have agreed to um, send you um, a written response as well. And also um, minutes of this meeting will be published so you can, um, and it'll be published online um, so that others will also be able to see the response that's been given. So um, that being said, I think that's the end of, of your um, time allocated to ask the question. Um, however, you do know that um, members uh, of the council can be um, contacted by their surgeries or by email. So you are welcome to contact members should you so wish. Okay. Of course. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Kerry. Um, and I, I think we've been quite gracious there. Um, so, yeah, thank you for attending. So, moving on to the matter at hand, um, the committee is to determine or whether there is evidential basis to commence steps to consult on publishing a cumulative impact assessment, um, which would identify one or more CIAs within the borough. Um, I have to stress again, uh, for everyone in this meeting and online, that no decisions have been made yet. No decisions have been made on this. Um, so can I ask uh, uh, David Stewart, the business regulation team leader, licensing and technical support to introduce us. the report. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, Chair. And um, so uh, as you've heard, this report is a, a follow up essentially of the um, uh, diminutive impacts research report which we um, published uh, on uh, for the for consideration on the 14th of November um, so the recommendations today are to consider the options in the options paper um, and we for, just to remind it, uh, members we looked at or commissioned uh, researchers looked at five areas in Hackney and um, the former Shoreditch Special Policy Area the Dalston's former Dalston Special Policy Area, an area of Broadway Market, London Fields, area of Hackney Central, and an area of, of um, Hackney Wick. Uh, as, as you'll be aware, CIA Community Impact Assessment, or CIA, may be published by Licensing Authority to help it limit the types of license applications granted in areas where there is evidence uh, to show that the number and density of licensed premises in the area is having a negative um, community impact on the promotion of the licensing objectives. So these would reply to these would apply to applications for new uh, premises licenses, uh, sub premises certificates, or variations of those um, existing premises licenses and or club premises certificates. The license for that sets out the steps that we that a licensing authority needs to carry out uh, in order to publish a CIA. Um, one of those steps is to consult. So any CIA published by a licensing authority must also be summarised in its licensing policy. But for the purposes of uh, consultation, I've um, made reference to it, um, the licensing authority must uh, provide persons prescribed in the acts. Those are essentially uh, license holders, certificate holders, uh, personal license holders, um, uh, responsible authorities. Uh, it must uh, pro provide those persons with um, the reasons why we're considering publishing a community of impact assessment, a general indication of the part or parts of its area, which it's considering describing. So that's the, those are the boundaries. Mm -hmm. And then whether it considers that the assessment will relate to all relevant authorizations 
or only to relevant authorizations of a particular kind. So that's where you could potentially say um, a certain type of proposal, whether it be hours, whether it be activities, the um, CIA applies to those, but not to others. Um, so the 626 Limited in junction with Make Associates were commissioned to carry out the community of impact research um, in their report, which was uh, published as part of the agenda in November. Um, they set out their findings, their methodology, uh, which included crime mapping, uh, looking at various statistics, um, CCTV statistics, ambulance, etc. And uh, they obviously produced a very detailed report and detailed findings. But some of the highlights or high level findings were that Shoreditch remains Hackney's most significant hotspot for recorded crime, uh, London Ambulance Service call outs, fixed penalty notices, and CCTV log incidents. Although they did note that those figures had fallen from the last uh, full year uh, prior to the impact of the uh, COVID 19 pandemic. And their findings also found that Dalston was around half or less of shortage incident counts. Um, I think uh, Brian was about, I think it was four times less on average um, in Dalston. Um, but they, as you've alluded to, Chair, um, uh, the Commission, uh, the researchers uh, found that the northern stretches, northern and southern stretches of the previous um, Dalston special policy area saw very few incidents um, quite significantly so. Um, Hackney Central, Hackney Wick and Broadway Market um, exhib exhibited varying levels of crime incidents and um, significantly lower numbers than in Shoreditch. And the conclusion was that Shoreditch stands out as the only uh, location with a majority of all recorded crime and other indicators take place at night. And it's obviously our, um, the, the nighttime economy area, the area of the borough with the highest concentration of uh, nighttime places. However, the evidence did show that there had been a significant post pandemic improvement in crime um, within Shoreditch and within Dalston, uh, and significant reductions in LAS, um, so London Ambulance Service, alcohol related call outs. So there were some positive uh, uh, indicators from, uh, from the research that was carried out. So, so the options, so you'll recall that we talked about some potential, us uh, as officers presented some potential op, um, options at the uh, subsequent licensing committee. Um, given that the uh, three areas of Broadway, uh, three areas of Hackney Broadway Market, uh, Hackney Central and Hackney Wick were not really found to be exhibiting any sort of significant or noticeable or uh, levels of incidents that were uh, considered to require an intervention. We've not, we won't be looking at those areas any further. Mm -hmm. um, they were not considered to be suffering from negative community of impact. Mm -hmm. So as a result of that, um, however, obviously Shoreditch and Alston um, are two areas where um, we feel having looked at the evidence that's been related uh, require some sort of intervention. Um, so, so that's essentially what we would uh, consult on. So if I refer members to the options uh, at the last, so the ultimate page of the report, they're page 44. So options for shortage. Um, so we potentially, so just a reminder, so the consultation is um, reasons why, so our reasons for consulting would be set a summary of what um, the um, 66 Limited and Make, Associ Make Associates um, mm -hmm. their findings. So that, that that would be our rationale, our reasons for considering it. Um, and then the gen general indication in the in 66's research, they talk about um, sure, it's still been very uh, intense in some areas. Uh, so 
in paragraph 58 of the report, um, of 6 or 6 is report, they talk about a significant change in the spatial distribution of crime in Shoreditch. Um, and it's yep. remained high within the triangle and yep. uh, post pandemic, the most intense hotspot had moved to the west, including Paul Street, mm -hmm. Leonard Street, Blackwood Street, and Bravery Street. Yep. So, therefore, what we propose to give a general indication of in the patient is a, a, a widened boundary over the previous shortage uh, special parts area, including those. Yeah, um, any maps to indicate that to members? Yeah. Be useful for members to see. Would members like to see yeah. Okay. So the first one we're looking at, folks, is shortage. I'm sure you're aware of that, but just in case. I think they're... So that... <laughs> just talk about What I've got here is the, the previous shortage SPA boundary. Yep. So the, the research has talked about this area. See my cursor. This area here to the South. west, the southwest, just here. Yeah. Um, so, so general indication that we would give in any consultation would be to to include that corner. Yeah. If you like. Yeah. Yep. So we would we would if we're minded to go to consultation, it would. Yep. This would be the area. Oh, oh, can we, sorry. Sorry, I know you're deliberating it, but can we just, David, can you, <laughs> David, can you just repeat just that last bit, please? Uh, so, okay. So, this is the previous Shoreditch SPA. Um, and so we're, what we're suggesting is that this area shaded in blue is uh, included in, a, in any consultation, if you're minded to grant, as one of the areas where we're yeah. considering yeah. Um, describing in the assessment. Yeah, and you've just referred to paragraph 58 in the report yeah. for everybody watching, where you know there's been a significant rise to the southwest, uh, essentially. Um, distribution of crime and hotspots moving to, to the west around uh, Paul Street, Leonard Street, Black, Blackall Street, and Raby Street. Raby Street's still in it. Um, with a large amount of displacement, growth of crime southwestwards, and that's why the team have decided to look at that area there. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Are, there, are there any 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 comments that anyone wants to make about that? Yes, I do. Okay, Councillor Mullen. This oh, the purple boundary is the goes further than the mm. identified area of what is there a rationale for not including this what the, the, the bit the bit south of worship street you mean yeah, yeah. the researcher didn't really have any evidence that would support or that um extended any sort of uh, cia or cip oh. to that area okay um if you're in that area it's much i'd say it's a lot more commercial in terms of office and um oh it's finsbury square type area okay no that's fine it's right yeah. 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 okay yeah. councillor sizer you got any comments you'd like to make about that no not particularly other than i i anecdotally again know uh, of the rationale to include the purple shaded in um and just to highlight as a general that as councillors we've been receiving a lot of anxiety via emails um, about uh, any changes that might happen and, and, an, and a desire that we do consult um, from residents that there's been a lot of support from residents to go ahead yeah so just to note that. Uh, from the report in this meeting. 
Um, David, I don't know if you want to talk about because as we're talking about, I mean, we could actually just bounce through these, uh, you know, agreements essentially at the end. At the end here, as we're working on shortage at the moment, we may as well talk about it and agree it in, or whatever now. Yeah. Um, just going to page forty-four of the report um, and the options that are there. Can you just explain the difference really between the first two to 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 uh, the, to members? I could do it if you want, but if you want to do that. Okay, so that, that, that would be kind of useful. So we talked about the area, and now we want to talk about the kind of special policy area that we could consider, and that's in relation to on page forty-four, number one and number two of the option paper under shortage. But the first one says a CIA to apply to all relevant authorizations, or a CIA to apply to only to relevant authorizations. And those two things are very different. Yeah, do, do we understand that? Yes. So it's either to all, everybody who comes to apply has to go through this process, or for example, um, late night refreshment venues, that, uh, restaurants that go up to core hours might be, uh, we might not have to kind of consider them under an SBA. Smaller capacity restaurants, say of capacity around 50 covers, for example, would be kind of excluded. So that's really what we're kind of thinking about there. Um, does that explain it, David? Do you want to come yeah. in and maybe explain it better? Yeah. So that the reason for it is, um, if you uh, refer back to the, uh, when a licensing authority must consult, um, the first thing it must consult on is its reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, second thing, the general indication for area. Uh, and the third thing is whether that um, CIP or CIA would apply to all types of um, authorization or just relevant ones. Yeah. So that's the, that's the reason why that option is yeah. is there to you know, cancel government. Can we also break down what the SIA means in that context or what the options are for that? Sorry? This... CIA, sorry. <laughs> 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 the, just the fact that it could be an SPA or an um, SCA. A C, a C, yeah, a, C, um, a CIA would mean that um, applications in that area, the, the presumption is to refuse an application in that area um, unless the applicant can demonstrate that they... So, um, so when it's not proposed that we'd consider, because obviously our licensing policy that we all agreed to in the summer gives us the opportunity to consider a SPA or an yes. SCA. Mm. So are we excluding, are these options presented excluding that? Excluding, sorry. So us discussing those two options. That's for members to decide that's not... Yeah, happening. but that's the way that this is presented, I don't think makes that clear that that's an option. It, it, the way I see it anyway, it just says the area within the boundary formally identified and it says a CIA. So would the consultation say a CIA or would it be for us tonight to decide if it's an SPA or an SPA? That comes later, Councillor Garber, I believe. Is that right? It, it, yeah. That, that, that comes later or down the line when, when the consultation goes out. We're deciding tonight to put the consultation out and then they will provide options like this. Do you want to have an SPA or an SCA and what area and all that kind of stuff here? Yeah. That would come out in the consultation. Oh, okay. Is that right, David? Am I right on that? Yeah. 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 So it, it could be something. Still looking a little up. bit quizzical. Not happening. No, it's fine. I, I, yeah. Okay. It could be something that comes out of the consultation based on the feedback that, um, that we decide um, if we're minded to go out to consultation that, um, that, and, uh, uh, a presumption to refuse all of applications in this area isn't it's too long it's you know it's not justified however we feel that um there uh, some sort of intervention in this area some sort of policy approach in this area is still required yeah mm -hmm. councillor sizer i can see you've put your hand up online yeah just a a wider question i guess with the consultation that we could how are we going to, if that's where we head towards, how do we make sure that it really is a representative group of people that are responding to the consultation rather than just a few very strong voices? If, uh, maybe that's not the right way to put it, but, um, but that it really is representing all the people within that area, not just a few. How, how can we really work on that? 
that's something we could take away and um, discuss with the... Yeah, it's a very good question, Councillor Sides. Of course, we wanted to extend to as many people as possible, really, that are interested. Mm. Yeah. Um, I think in the past, um, it tends to... The consultations do tend to be um, maybe not necessarily representative of the, you know, of the borough as a whole, but um, it, can, it can be without sort of targeting and door, door knocks and polling, that sort of thing, it can be... Um, difficult to get something that's really representative yep. but but that, that's um we would collect monetary inf information and then attach weight to that uh, in making the decision i mean it, it, yeah okay yeah. Yeah. Coming in the of that. Um, we need to to that in terms of consultation because the danger is making it all online um and trying to reach people that don't necessarily go online and aren't that active i know when they did the live consultation a lot of work was done on as particularly as it was through the sort of pandemic time, but how they went out and how they actually engaged with people and got their views. So it might be worth looking at that as a way to try and widen the So I really agree with Councillor Sizer. Mm -hmm. The danger is it will be people who know about this and who have strong views. And we know there's people that you know want to hear all views and the diversity. Because one thing, if I remember rightly, from the the, the figures we got from that consultation the consultants did was it was something like I don't know 70 percent white people and you know it wasn't a diverse representation of our community I can't remember the figures at the top of my head but I do remember mentioning it yeah I'd just like to bring in Jerry here for this point I just say in any consultation we undertake paper copies are available to anybody who wants them and also secondly next question you might ask is about one person filling in 10 forms we have ways and means of finding that out so it is actually representative so one person filling in the paper form and doing it online, that will get picked up by the consultation team. I don't think it's, I mean, it's not about not being the paper forms, but it's how you yeah. get people to know about those paper forms. Consultation, any consultation with the age, with the consultation team, the age with TMOs, TRAs, every group will be put into the consultation. It will be in the consultation document, who's getting a copy of it, residents associations, board panels, yeah. everything, any residents group, anything that's happened. We'll get consulted on that. And, that. and there will be ample time for the consultation to be done. We'll make sure it doesn't happen during the school holiday period, et cetera, et cetera. So any work, with, and if necessary, we have an existing consultation. We're doing some other work, and we extended it for that reason. So if we think that we're not getting it to the right people, we can extend it if needs be. Yeah. I mean, um, I think that's good, because the figures we had, I'm trying to see if I can find them in the report, but it was quite shocking how it wasn't representative at all who they didn't live in the borough. So I just want to bring in Amanda before I bring in Councillor uh, Mullen. Yes, I just wanted to say that there is a requirement to um, ensure that there's a, uh, an equality impact assessment done um, as part of the process. So that means that um, all areas of the public, you know, um, to ensure that, you know, everyone gets an, a fair and equal chance to um, make their representation. So it's not just limited just to people who, for example, attend pub watch, sure. for example. It would be for the wider community, it will be published wide mm -hmm. and um, there will be, as um, Jerry has said, um, that it will be the consultation team has to do a, um, the statutory consultation to everyone. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so it will probably be, you know, hopefully publicised in like uh, public places, libraries and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Um, yeah, thank you, Amanda. Uh, Councillor Mawela. Um, Building on what Councillor Maxwell has said, um, two questions if we do go ahead. Um, is there a way for you to um, weight um, the consultation responses, whether they're resident, business, a uh, person that goes to a premises, that sort of thing? Is that a consideration? And the second thing is, um, based on previous experience which was got quite nasty unnecessarily um is there a way we've had a lot of people who live in and around this area both residents and businesses that have engaged with the licensing um process um coming to committees writing in for and against things that sort of thing is there a way that we would tell them that this is happening because they are they are kind of self-identified stakeholders who have taken an interest and might live in this postcode area is that something to to try and balance um, a kind of a, an imbalance in responses coming back and levels of organization just to, to make it genuine yeah 
Uh, so the first question to wait or to identify who the um, respondent is, mm -hmm. um, that, that would typically be a question um, either in the monitoring section or, or up front in the consultation that the consultation team would put in that consultation um, survey. Right. Uh, so I think in the past we've pretty much always done that. Um, I think it would say something, you know, are you a resident, are you a business owner, are you a user of the nighttime economy, those sorts of, those sorts of things. Uh, and then the second question, yeah, we, we will, um, as well as to make um, uh, online consultation, uh, food council, social channels, um, the statutory consultation um, parts that we have to um, carry out. Uh, we just do quite simple things like banners across our um, web page uh, and uh, where we send out um, notifications of hearings or notifications of applications being received. We would um, put a line in there for the, for example, to say uh, this consultation is is, is ongoing. Um, but usually, that would that would capture people who are engaged with that process at that time, not necessarily um, you know, other people. But, so what I'm saying is because we have had people in the last 12 months who have engaged with the process, there, there isn't in theory any reason why we couldn't email them to say we're consulting on the policy and it affects the area that you live or work. Just for GDPR, we, we wouldn't be able to do that for um, <laughs> unless we had um, Unless they had completed the subject that says, do you mind for us to oh, to for this sort of thing, then we, we wouldn't be able to do that. I see. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. Councillor Luckin. Um, yeah, um, if I were going out to consultation, I think that's the right thing to do. Um, when are we planning on doing it? Uh, well, we actually, yeah. Oh, I was going to say, decision to be made. And then make a decision to do it, when will we do it? We will work with the consultation team as soon as the decision is made to set up a timetable for this to happen. Is it in the next six months? In the next oh, yes. Month? Yeah. Yes. So it's, next, it's sort of imminent, is it? Imminent, yes. But obviously, one of the things we need to take into account is that at some point, there's London mayoral election coming up, and the council would be in power at that point, and given this, and if you would like something that's very political, we would need to get a decision from the monitoring officer of the weather we can proceed with this at this point and we'd have to wait until after that. Okay, and, and is, it, is it a 12-week consultation? It would be eight normally. Okay. Fine. Okay, thank you, Jerry. Uh, Thanks. So just, yeah, it's a quick question on, uh, just a bit comment on consultation because obviously we're a huge resource as councillors so we need to, it'd be really good if we push it out as much as we can. Like I put the last one in a ward newsletter so that everyone in Dalston was aware of the last consultation. So um, we could all, yeah, it's for us to, yeah, so if we get good notice we can all plan to promote it to residents as well. Yeah, I'd like that. Um, and I think I just want to go back. I know we are kind of, we're still kind of on straw ditch, aren't we? Yeah. Where we are. Yeah. Okay. But when we get to the decision bit, it would be really helpful for me to understand when that, the special policy area and special consideration area bit gets put to the public or to us to consider. I think the way you've just described it is that we put something out, it comes back, and then at that point we consider if it warrants one or the other which i think is a slightly different understanding to what i had before i thought we, we were considering that here because it seems odd that we're considering to limit the geography the type of license but we're not considering the type of spa or sca at this point but maybe that was just yeah. was okay jerry if members are minded to agree to recommend us then that can be put into the consultation okay. i'm i I'm not understanding what it is that you want us to do. Yes. So a special policy area. Yeah, but what difference between a special... Oh, yeah, I know that. But what is it that you're saying? I, I don't get what you're saying. So what is it that you want us to do? It's, it's for each one we consider, like when we're discussing shortage, can we discuss if we think it should be SPA or SCA? And then we would discuss Dalston, we discussed if we think it should be SPA or SCA. But I think the officers are saying that we're not making a decision between those two things. We're just deciding on the principle of whether we go and ask people. This is where I'm confused because Jerry was saying okay. we could do that if we want to. If you want, it's up to members as well. I'll take advice from the legal advisor. But my view is it's up to members to recommend what you want in the consultation. And so we, it's SPA. I thought it was a CA. I thought that wasn't. Cumulative impact area. Mm -hmm. 
it's but there's two types. You've got the special policy area and special consideration area. Special policy area is the presumption to refuse, which we've currently got in the way the process is. Mm -hmm. In our license policy, we agreed a special consideration area, which just means that people have to pay a more nuanced approach to the particular area. Yeah. So it's saying it's more than if it's not, yeah. but it's not quite as much as an SPA. So residents still get to... Um, so, and I'm saying... Can we just just step forward here? Here? Just a point of clarification. Yes. Yeah. Yes. People are talking about a special policy area. No, I thought it was a community. I thought that was just replaced by cumulative impact area. Yes. Yeah. Are they so, all, can you all just call it the same thing? Yes, it's just about terminology. CIM is cumulative impact settlement. Yeah, a cumulative impact area. Okay, and what and we, then become a special policy area? Yes. No, okay. or it could be a C A. There's two options. Yeah, there's a, yeah, it's just it's a term, it's a terminological yeah, problem. The outcome is it correct? Um, they was that it's the outcome of the CIA case that determines whether or not there's a special policy. Yeah. Or a special consideration area. Yeah. Yeah. We need to, yeah. Yeah. So can I just it's on page I've got the license page policy open if we Yeah, no, no, it's fine. No, that's not the issue. No, I think um, it was understandable, I, yeah. You understand. No, no, yeah. I think we need to be Can I um on page forty four, it has both options and I just I guess it doesn't, it, that doesn't include both options. It doesn't include but, the FDA. But deciding now suggests that we have predetermined what we want it to be, and we haven't done that. Mm. So I, I'd say that's my, it would make more sense, therefore, to just go out to both areas with these options and then decide what is the best based on what but I think. I think the language is slightly confused in this at the moment because on the left column in the area bit, it mentions special policy area, and in the option. It's a former special former yeah. policy area. Yeah, and then in this bit, it just says CIA, but if that just went out to residents. This is not the consultation document. Yeah. The consultation document will have... Oh, sorry. And that's what I was asking. Can we as a committee make the decision about if we talk about the difference between an SPA and an SCA here? Because we're talking about geography, we're talking about types of licences. So it would just be interesting if we also discuss the level of special policy area or special consideration. I would... I mean, I don't know. I feel like it's. I feel like we're going round and round. Yeah, mm. and I feel like it does say former special policy area. It, it, it it geographic areas. But I think, yeah. Clarify the difference, or what the policy. They're making the decision on today. You know, but so the decision is um, to um, whether to consult on uh, whether we publish, uh, decide to publish it. Community impact, impact assessment, assessment. And, and what that could do is um this defined areas so define where policies apply so it could do that i think could you clarify recommendation one so that's recommendation two is that right recommendation i think this goes back to what i was saying before the meeting about just being crystal clear about what we ask residents and then what we do with that information yeah. and who gets to make the decision at each of those points. Ultimately, the licensing commission will make yeah. the final decision yeah. at the end of the, after consultation. Yeah. Councillor yeah. Maxwell. I can't okay, emphasize that no decision is being made. Yes. All yeah, we're yeah. asking <clears throat> is do you want to make a recommendation to go out to consultation on an expanded shortage, well, uh, then publish a CIA based on that? That would then decide whether it is actually special policy yeah. area or special yeah. consideration area. Or, yeah. or, or also none of those as well. Or none. Or none, depending on what the outcome is. Which is what it says on page 44. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. In the two boxes. Yeah. 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 Councillor Maxwell. Uh, I mean, I just wanted to really agree with Councillor Moema that I think we shouldn't be predetermining it. And mm -hmm. we should, I mean, I think the language, I agree with Councillor Gar, but it needs to be very clear because the people can, you know, we need to make it very clear what the different options are and what they mean. Um, but I don't think we should be recommending one option or another. I think we should be putting a number of options and getting those views. Yeah, that would, go, that would, that would, that would be a good wouldn't it, yeah. uh, David? It could be, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, any other points on this? Essentially, we're at the stage now um, where we're talking about shortage. Um, uh, can we agree on which option on page 44 Agreed. Um, of the report will be taken for this area? Now, do you want all relevant authorizations in this, or do you want it to apply only to relevant 
authorizations? That's the key question that we need to answer. Yeah, I think that's all relevant. Do we want all relevant authorizations to be? That have the different options underneath that to be able to understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Or do we want only relevant authorizations? That would exclude things like late night refreshment venues, restaurants opening op operating up to core hours, for example. Or smaller capacity restaurants up to 50 who would be kind of excluded yeah so that's that's the question we need to answer so let's have a vote on it can i just, can I just ask a question or will this debate it first a little bit it's just a point of clarity around the type of venues i'm not going to open up the pre yeah, okay david do you want to chip in here on this just in terms of the evidence it just in the um introduction you gave we didn't i don't think the evidence talks about the different venues so i don't think it's like we're it's gone into that there is a you know in dalston off licenses discussed at quite length but i don't think that's the same in shoreditch unless i've missed some of that detail just to, to inform our decision based on the evidence yeah david in terms of us making a decision about each but, all right. good to know if there was a, if you think there's any important evidence that we need to be aware of about the different venues different types of um uh, there's, there's probably um a suggestion around that uh, question that could be included in a in a um consultation so it was it was a subject making that suggestion okay could these could it be this type of um business that you look at um that we consider to be exempt if you like use the term exempt but um which provides more flexibility in the policy essentially yes. that option do people want to debate it or do you just want to go straight to a vote on this it, it could even be a it could even be something that we consult on can i make this yeah. oh i was going to say <laughs> i was going to say i would like us to move to a vote shortly yeah. but this seems like a question that we should include in a consultation with an explanation to the public yeah. exempt yeah. this would be exempt yeah. this would be exempt yeah. Yeah. included this would be included this would be included yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. and then we can make a decision based on that feedback yeah. and then i would like my other thing was to come in to vote please <laughs> how does that have you do i think that's something we could um that we could certainly consult on i don't Okay, so, so what we do now then, because we've got these three options that we're supposed to decide on, which one? Um, we're not deciding on any then. <laughs> well, no, I think you're saying that you want to have both, but to set out what the what they are. Mm. Yeah, yeah, okay, so, so yes. Having both, so yeah, yeah. The, yeah. the request is for, the, for, for it to proceed to um, consultation with both um, yeah. uh, scenarios yeah. open. Yeah. On none. Okay. On, on, we, on, yeah, yeah. But, but, to, three, that, but, to, it, but to expand the questions further is is that acceptable yeah. david yeah yeah okay so Sorry, chair can yeah. i come in so what are we saying are we saying leave don't vote on any options now just take all three is that what no i, th I, I think we need to vote on whether we want to see a cia at all so mm -hmm. if we have a vote on that to start with so do we think we need to see uh, 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 do we think we need to go out to consultation on the cia on exactly yeah. 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 <laughs> exactly exactly thank you councillor lufkin do we think we need to go out to consultation on the shortage cia yes yeah so yeah that's yeah. that's unanimous yes in the room councillor sergeant unfortunately you don't get a vote <laughs> Um, okay, so we've ruled out uh, no CIA to apply, and we want the other two to be included in the in the consultation. Yeah, that's our decision on shortage. Is that okay? Everyone? This is the first two combined, isn't yes. it? Yes. Yeah. Happy with that? Everyone? Yeah. Oh. Right then. Uh, we can move on. To... We need to vote on that as well. We just know. Uh, well, we can do. Uh, so we want both options uh, in the right. in the consultation. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Great. Okay. So let's move on to Dalston then. Um, so David, you want to go through Dalston? First is. Um, by the way, does anybody need a cup of By the way. No. Everyone having to crack on. Yeah. Is that, I'm, I said, so, oh yes, yeah, so on the on the shortest one, we're all agreed to the extension of the area. 
Yeah. 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 Thank you. Uh, that was Susan. Sorry, Chair. Since both of these um, are going to go out, uh, are we agreeing that both are going to go out? So when we do consultation, um, and we were being told earlier on about all the good ways we're going to do consultation, we need face to face because I think there needs to be people asking questions, yeah, as well as just getting the information. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, but we can I, I do believe that the licensing team are going to consider how they can do that. Yeah, that's consider. what I was going to say. Because we are finding it complicated, then you know we have to make yeah. it really, really, really ultra, ultra straightforward for. Um, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, okay, David, off you go, Dos. Yeah. So the six till six bank associates when they completed. Uh, their evidence. They they said that Dalston was generally, Dalston generally has around half or less of Shoreditch's incident counts. Now, where these do occur, they are mostly at the central part of the previous Dalston SPA. The northern and southern stretches of the previous Dalston SPA saw often saw fewer incidents than many other non nighttime economy areas of the borough. So, what I've got on the screen is. Um, a zoom in version, you'll, you'll recall that the, the Dalston SPA, I think it's about one and a half, or the previous Dalston SPA, about one and a half miles long. So it starts in the north at um, the junction of the A10 and Victorian Road and goes all the way south um, through Dalston Town Centre uh, into Kingsland High Street. This is the Baller one, yeah? Yeah. Yes. Mm. Uh, it's Dalston Junction into uh, Kingsland Road. Yeah. Um, past the junction with Forest Road, uh, past the junction with um, Richmond Road, mm -hmm. Kingsland Waste, yeah. and then it ends just south of Kingsland Waste, so uh, Middleton Road. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so just uh, looking back at uh, the northern and southern stretches of previous Dalston SPA. Uh, so we would propose a map. Um, I don't have that level of detail of that, but yeah, um, gives an idea. We can look at an idea. So this is revised to go north to where Prince George Road is, and mm -hmm. um, again down south, down to down uh, Kings of Roads to the junction, uh, Crossway Shacklewell, uh, taken into um, the length of yep. Kings of High Street, mm -hmm. Let Square. Yep. Um, through Dawson Junction, and they see parades either side uh, up to the Frontier Road, Forest Road. Mm -hmm. I see Forest Road. Yeah. Oh yeah, I, I got you. The only issue I think, and I know that uh, in the north part of that there is Barra Barra in our ward, Councillor Janet Thomas. Um, and I'm not sure if, if, if we cut her off at, at Prince George, it would actually reach Barra Barra. I'm not sure, would it? The previous one didn't go to that far. Oh, it goes right up to the Victorian Road, the original one. So the, roughly the one police station is. They did? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. Okay, so that's good. I suggest we go out of consultation on the original area. Um, because if people want, my understanding is that if people want to object and bring it back smaller to a smaller area, they can say that in the consultation. Mm. But w w if we go out with the smaller area, we would not be able to extend it. Mm. So my suggestion would be that we go out with the original one, and if people say actually, if, I don't, if people come back to the consultation responses and we have the evidence, and we eventually we say actually, having considered the evidence. We think it should be reduced to a smaller area. We can do that. However, if we do the second option and go out to the with the with the option one shown in blue, we cannot then expand it if people disagree with that. It yeah, would have to adopt the same approach, I think, for sure. It wouldn't we? If, if we did yeah. that for Dalston. So I, I would suggest we go out to consultation using the same methodology as we did in Shoreditch, A and options A and B combined on the larger area. How does that sound to officers? I'm Comments and that that's a decision for members to make. Yeah, how do members, members feel about that idea? Because I think in the report, 
um, just very briefly, objectively. Um, you know, it did say that the, the north and the south end of Dalton wasn't a problem, but the heart of Dalton is. But so we definitely need to have that as an option where we can actually top and tail this, in my opinion. But that could be one of the questions, couldn't it, with yeah. the Fordwich saying, do you want this to be expanded? Yeah. And also say with this one, is have we got the boundaries right? Yeah. yeah. Could it be smaller? Yeah, precisely. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Councillor for Janet Thomas. Oh, I think um, Yvonne just uh, covered what I wanted to say because if correct me if I'm wrong, David Jerry, we cannot after consultation we cannot expand mm -hmm. the uh, the area, but so it is good to go, and we can give us that flexibility to say actually let's um, shrink the boundary a little bit. In, yep. Rather than going and we cannot do anything after yep. afterwards. Yep. But my the other thing to consider is, or uh, we know from the evidence uh, before us that what uh, to, I think to maybe the way the reviewers uh, presented the evidence, obviously the numbers of licensed premises in Shoreditch and the numbers of the traffic flow in Shoreditch, you cannot compare it to those things. The two different, mm. uh, 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 they're two different in terms of nighttime economy. So we cannot be looking at the level of crime in Shoreditch with the same length as the level of crime in those things mm. because they, it cannot be. But having said that, there is still a level of crime in Dustin. What they're saying is that mm -hmm. the level of crime in daytime and nighttime are similar. So again, it's good for us to get this right. They're not saying there's no crime. There are no crimes. No, there, is crime, yeah. but, but there are crimes, but what they are saying is that the level of crime in the daytime in Dustin area is like the one at nighttime economy. Mm -hmm. So we just need to look at this. So part of, again, if we're applying the same principle like shortage and wanting to see how we can use the right approach for the Dustin area, would that be would it be possible david to ask you would that be uh, having an spa or having a special consideration area would that is that an option in terms of the consultation it's, it, it's, it could be an option that we yeah that we i mean i think the report you know ultimately sort of warrants it being downgraded to an sca in my opinion um, Councillor Garbutt. I, I do agree that we need to give options so that people can make comments on the street. But I think we need to take a consistent approach between Shoreditch and Dalston. And if we're presenting a map for Shoreditch where we've extended it based on the evidence in the report, I think we need to say the evidence in the report stated this, therefore here's a map for Shoreditch. Yep. If we took the same approach to Dalston, we'd say here is the evidence in the report, here's the map. And they talk about 400 metres in the middle, which would roughly be like Dolston Junction to maybe uh, Shacklewell Lane or something like that. I think that's probably a bit far. I think that's probably like 600. Um, so I think we need to be consistent because what we've got here is not the old one and it's not the recommendation from the evidence as in, in the suggested purple area. So I think I'd prefer that we say this is what the evidence said. It said that this 400 metres in the middle was the issue. Do you know what I mean? I think people need to know, otherwise they're going to be just looking at a map of the old one and don't have any evidence to, you know, they've only got their own experiences where I think people need to be really informed from this extensive evidence that we've got. So I'd like that to be forward as an option. And I agree with you, I think it should be an SCA because I think although there is um, still some crime, it's not anywhere near, and the report does acknowledge that it's nowhere near what you'd expect for the scale of the nighttime economy. And it's very unusual that it's got the difference between the daytime and the nighttime economy. Um, and it is half as much as Shoreditch. So I think that does show that we're kind of considering our options 
um, that you've got an SPA and an SCA and then a nothing. Yeah. And I think that kind of shows that we're considering the evidence and being proportionate. Yeah, so Gov, can you just point this out to the bit in the report where it says 400 metres, because I haven't read that myself. It does say 400 metres. I've never 400 metres before. Um, anyway, you can work on that. Uh, yeah. Councillor Maxwell. Uh, yes, I suppose I just want to, I've, I've have actually now found the demographics who of who were spoken to in the previous survey yep. and i think this is what really concerns me is why we need to have a really thorough consultation because so we've got some evidence what we haven't got is the evidence of the experiences of people in the area and i think as i said last time people do not always report things that happen yep. and it's often it goes out into the residential areas and that you know i know the difference because i live near dalston and i'm a councillor for Hoxton West, so I sort of know the difference between both areas, but with both of them, the impact goes much further than on the maps. I mean, if you look at it, the age distribution was, um, you know, very little people over 55 were spoken to, very, uh, only 6% were disabilities, ethnicity, 74% were white, 7.6% Asian or British Asian, and 1.5% Black or Black British, so we were really not reaching the you know people who are impacted so this is why I do think we do need to go out because I said we've got a lot of evidence from this consultation there's yeah. a lot of evidence missing about the impact on people but I agree that needs to be very um clear what we're looking at with people and I agree we need to have the same process for yeah. both yeah. um but I don't think we can dismiss the impact that residents have and also the reality that large chunks of our residents were obviously not talk to at all and that's why we do need to you know use counsellors because we can put pinpoints yep, yep. places this is a good tmo that's that good term but these are the key areas to speak to that sort of thing yeah thank you for that council as well and can we just note that again i mean we've already noted it but i can I just say councillor what councillor max was referring to is not the last licensing consultation it was the 66 report yeah and obviously, it would, they would have dealt mainly with businesses, jails of war, right. and stuff like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it would have been. I was meaning the consultants one, but they actually said we spoke to stakeholders. And I asked yes. what stakeholders? Because I, you know, they didn't speak to ward councillors who could have pointed them in the direction of various community groups, residents groups they could have spoke to. Mm. Um, so I don't know where they got their stakeholders from because they weren't using resources they could that would have made things easier for them and reached a better group but those figures uh it did not the next panels i know that and the many many the the panels. Hmm. sorry yeah a lot of places don't have panels yeah yes you need i mean as i say i think the library consultation is a good one and i think we need to get now and reach in various groups because you know you can sort of think oh people are tell us if they're not happy they don't I mean, you know that's why when we do our woven surgeries and speak to people we find out things when people haven't come in contact with us can i say in any consultation that you recommend is undertaken we will do this okay it's a completely it's a completely different form of stakeholder engagement that form 66 and make ourselves yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever no, undertaken. Yeah. I do agree with that, but that's why I'm just saying we've got evidence here, but we've got a lot of evidence missing. And that's what I think the consultation should give us. Yeah. yeah. That's why I want to go to the work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it's been noted, we have noted that by the yeah. way. So it's all good. Um Councilor Garvin. I'm sorry, I need to revise what I said the 400 meters is the bit where it's mostly condensed. This the recommendation from the evidence is from Forest Road to like Princess May. So this is almost what. Well, yeah, yeah we we pretty much nailed it. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Sorry, I miss and I've misconfer I've conflated yeah. information. And just on thank you, Matt, that was uh, Councillor Garber. Thank you. And just on Councillor Macro's point, very evidence space. Sorry, I've just conflated two points. And on yeah. Councillor Macro's point, I do agree that the consultation with residents is incredibly important. That we do have extent. This is this evidence that we are looking at is based on kind of crime figures, the London Ambulance Service you know cctv like there's yep. loads of stuff in here so it's i don't think it totally undermines what's in here i just exactly. think that we, we just need, need to have a bit yeah yeah exactly there's yeah. a bit missing which is people's yeah. experience of living there yeah. yeah yeah and just to say uh on dawson and objectively in relation to the report um you know dawson as far as the stakeholders the ones that they interviewed mm. were concerned expressed a general desire for a more relaxed flexible approach within the area i mean if your state cuts i don't know let's not go down this too much. no but, what, but i think that illustrates councillor maxwell's point yeah. if your stakeholders are residents yeah. 
they're not going to say that. If your stakeholders are yeah. license holders, they're absolutely going to say that. Yeah. So going out to everybody with the information is important so we get a balanced view with the caveat of weighting it so we don't have an imbalance or an unrepresentative return like yeah. we did last time of 74 percent yeah. white 30 yeah. year olds who go out drinking yeah. in shortage yeah. and yeah. Yeah. excellent thank you That's what I I yeah i totally agree that we need to do as much consultation as possible but i think we shouldn't assume that license holders would be promoting something that they think would be unsafe i'm just saying I think on the, i'm not i'm not I'm let not me finish saying. just let me finish i think license holders know their areas really well and i think the success of all the work sam does is because license holders are fully engaged in pub watch Dalston pub watch has got an award it's the third it's the third in the uk as a Dalston pub watch of an engaged group of license holders so i think yes there is a reason license holders that obviously they want to be able to run their business, you know, and provide more entertainment and, you know, be able to have a kind of thriving local economy. But I don't think they would be promoting something if they didn't think it was a safe or right thing to do. I'm not saying they are. I'm just saying we should go out to residents as well. Okay, so we'll let's, 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 uh, I think we've, we've had a good discussion around Dalston. Yeah. Um, uh, I think Councillor Lufkin's. Um, Suggestion, if everyone can remember it. It's a good one. Yeah. Um, shall we just vote on that one? I mean, obviously, uh, the third option, no CIA to apply. We're rejecting that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Can we vote on that? Mm -hmm. no. Well, would you? Would, would, oh, it's just clear that you first two, and if yeah, you might want to take a vote on that. Yeah. Well, we'll take a vote sure. on that, and no CIA to apply, so we're going to reject that. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's quite clear. I can see. Oh, I thought you wanted to. <laughs> well, it's fine. They've all said. No, I think well, for I, yeah. Natalie's oh, for benefit. The record. So, um, no CIA to apply. We're rejecting no CIA. I mean, we're rejecting. I it being included, but I'm. We're rejecting no CIA. So, okay, so this is in favour of yeah. rejecting yeah. the CIA. Yeah. Mm. yeah. The no CIA. Yeah. Okay. And so, the opposite. Of having this no CIA. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I want no CIA. Well, You've just lost, sorry. Yeah, I know, but it's important to be counted, isn't it's it? It's good. We're all democratic. Um, and then we're voting on Councillor Lufkin's suggestion, which was the whole, the whole area mm -hmm. um, with two elements within yes. and expressing as well as Shoreditch, SBA versus SCA in that as well yes yeah and the difference oh. the and geography what? the options like yeah, yeah. yes yes and, and yeah i think david's got that this yeah. geographical changes as council of garbage the evidence, to, yeah. the evidence yeah. is you do this in shortage and do that in, in dalston yeah okay. i think we've got the area pretty much nailed in dalston so it's this this um the area existing. The, the existing area so not this area mm. existing area but presenting it alongside what the evidence says about what yeah so they're making so for shoreditch maybe they're well they're looking at the bigger one because i get that we have to present a bigger one but it says this is why because the evidence says this yeah. it's also what I presented as is but with a paragraph that says yeah. the evidence found actually this yeah you know, like it says yeah. 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 yeah it's going to be a really yeah. heavy yeah. consultation my, my limited gis skills are uh, Okay, so we do a vote on 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 uh, Councillor Lufkin's suggestion, mm -hmm. which is sort of on page forty four. It's just been expanded because we do the whole area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we'll vote on that. So yeah, in favour. Okay, it's unanimous in the room. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, I think we've done Dawson then. Yeah. Uh, the other areas: Broadway Market, Hackney Central, and Hackney Wick. Um, We'll just have a vote on on no CIA to apply to those three areas. Yes. Yeah, those in favour. So that's going out to consultation. No. No. no it's we're just not even yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Sorry, I didn't make that clear. Yeah. yeah. We're not going out to consultation for CIA on those three areas. Yeah. Yes. Fantastic. So that's unanimous as well. Fantastic. Um, and one. So I think we've done down to Hackney Wick, um, and then uh, to note the proposed timetable 
publication and cons consultation of any cumulative impact assessment. Yeah. Have we got that? Yeah. David? Yeah. Seven days. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, you can come back to the committee with, with those dates. Fantastic. So, agenda item seven. Any other business? Members are to note that licensing subcommittee dates for March, May have been circulated. Um, there are still a number of councillors who have not confirmed their availability. Please see Natalie at the end of the meeting and let her know which hearings you are able to attend. Natalie is right here. <laughs> um, any any other business, uh, Councillor Susan Rungan? Uh, just a point of information uh, that on the 31st of January, during the day, I think about three o'clock, we're having a borough-wide pub watch meeting um, with stakeholders, and I think. Um, yeah. Councillor Susanna Fajana Thomas will be uh, yeah. speaking, and also we're going to get the night star there. So if anybody can make it, that would yeah. be really great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what, could what you date? circulate it? Yeah. What date? It, it will be oh, circulated. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it will be circulated to all members. Right. Okay. Yeah. It would be great if, if members could come to that because it's, really it's, it's going to be a great event. Yeah. I think. I think. I think. Um, Sam has already sent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He sent an oh, invite for. Yeah. So you should have it in your. In uh, I think emails have got out, but it hasn't gone out as an invite in diary. Which, if other people function like I do, if it's yeah. not in my diary, I so that might be clear. Remember that it exists. Yeah, yeah. So so yeah. 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 Yeah.